All right, Matt, it's time for our main event of the evening. I'm really excited about this one. We've got ranked contenders at heavyweight. We've got Augusto Sakai taking on a really tough test in Alistair Overeem. Matt, this is Alistair Overeem's fourth straight main event. Some of them have gone his way. Some of them, maybe they haven't. And realistically, if you look at it in his last five, he's been incredibly active. I mean, going back to that fifth to last fight, Curtis Blades, he loses that one in, do you call it impressive fashion? It was impressive for Curtis Blades, but yeah. that was two years ago. Picks up a win over Sergey Pavlovich, e Sergey. Then he picks up a really big win over Alexei Olenek in Russia. That was a year and four months ago. Loses to Rosenstrike in you know the eleventh hour, and then he beats Walt Harrison his last time out earlier on this year. And that was a really impressive win for him, picking up the big second round finish. There was a lot of hype in that fight, and it was booked multiple times due to extenuating circumstances. Obviously canceled and rescheduled, but Overeem. <sighs> It's something that's kind of plagued him over the last, I don't know what, six, seven years, the the glass cannon term. For, no, but, no, 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 not six, seven years. His whole career in 1999 in his first fight, it was an issue. It's not something that just showed up. Like when he was a light heavyweight in Pride, everyone knew he didn't have a great chin. And it's just, we say this in a lot of his fights, but it just, it definitely rings true in this one more than others. He's better than Sakai in pretty much everything. Like, if you look at their striking, who's better? Well, of course, Alistair Overeem's the better striker. He's faster. He hits way harder. He has better movement. He has more. He has a wider arsenal of tools. Like, I guess the Sakai doesn't go for head kicks very often. And Overeem, at the age of 40, just finished a guy with a head kick. So, Overeem's a better striker, a more versatile striker. He's better on the ground. He has really good wrestling that's underrated. He's a superior grappler. We saw that, again, in the Walt Harris fight. When he got on top of Walt Harris, he just beat the brakes off him. But Augusto Sakai is a big guy. He has pretty good striking. And if you can clip over him on the end of the chin, it's good night. And the thing for Sakai, I mean, decent reach at uh, heavyweight. You know, you can really look into it if you want to. Uh, 77 inches over him dwarfs him there. He slightly dwarfs him in height. Now, those stats are always skewed by the UFC. I mean, Christian Aguilera stood next to Sean Brady. And Aguilera, or sorry, Brady was supposed to be the taller fighter. There was a discrepancy there. Now, who wore flip-flops, who wore shoes? I don't know, but... I always take those with a grain of salt. You look at it when Overeem fought Rosenstrike and they were listed at about the same, but Overeem, the much taller guy in there. So it's one of those things that you wonder about Overeem. He uses distance well for the most part until he gets just, well. just a little bit sloppy. He can run away sometimes. Like we've seen some fights where he's just on his bike, but in reverse, it's really weird. Like he's a guy with bad knees. So he has to bike on the stationary in reverse. Um, but really for Alistair Overeem grappling, it's one of those things that people always talk about, but we never see it from him. I'm not even going to talk about it here because I don't think it's going to play much of a factor. I mean, you said it against Walt Harris. What do we know Walt Harris for? He's an explosive striker and he moves in a straight line. Alistair Overeem was able to overcome that. And then you saw what happened in the second round of that fight. So for Gusto Sakai, let's kind of talk about his career because you might know him from his Bellator days. Of course, you know him from the win streak that he's on right now in the UFC. The lone loss to a guy that it seems like every single heavyweight, it's just kind of like a token. It's going to happen. It's an inevitability. You're going to lose a split decision to check Congo at some point in your career. It happened to Augusto Sakai, his draw against Dan Charles in the UFC. I mean, had a few buffer fights, the contender series to get him into the UFC. He's looked really good. I mean, had a win over Chase Sherman by finish. He beat Andre Orlovsky by split. He had a first round knockout win over Marcin Tabora. That's not easy to do, but it was his last fight that really, if he had an impressive performance over Bogoy Ivanov, and I'm going to follow this up really quickly. If you have an impressive performance over Bogoy Ivanov, holy smokes, this guy's a contender. Oh, yeah. It's hard to have an impressive performance against Bogoy Ivanov. Augusto Sakai did not. And then the last round of that fight in the final seconds where, you know, he's getting taken down, he's grabbing the cage, like he's doing everything he can to just claws his way to keep that victory. It wasn't all that impressive. The other trouble for me is the fact that that was a three round fight and he was on a steep decline getting into the end of it. So how many heavyweights do you know have two split decision outcomes in the last five fights? It's not a very common outcome for a check, check on go. Other than check Congo, because he's going to wrestle, but probably get outstruck, and then just kind of depends on what the judges are looking for. But with Sakai, it's is he a good striker? Well, of course he's a good striker. You can't knock out Marcin Debora and not be a good striker. But Augusto Sakai, in large part, it, he's a, somewhat of a basic striker. It's just he works by the jab, he throws a light kick. He doesn't do anything. That's he, 
his, I, I, I have to say this, you bring up a really good point. I hate to cut you off and everybody might, might complain about it, but he has a really, really nice leg kick, really oh, solid leg kick. And it's not like he's just going to rip calf kicks. He'll go high. He'll go to the knee. He can really place it very well. That's a good point. He can, but here's the problem. You're fighting one of the few heavyweights who actually checks leg kicks. Like over him checks his leg kicks. He picks his leg up. He checks the moves his knee inside. You're dealing with a guy who, again, unless he can keep on throwing leg kicks and then finally bring one up high and catch over and put him down, he can win. But even over him in his last fight, I think Walt Harris hits harder than Augusto to Sakai. He might not be as well-rounded, but I definitely think he's more explosive out of the two. He cracked over him clean, put him down, hit him with about 60 shots on the ground, and over him didn't go out. So... And not that I'm relying on Alistair Overeem's durability by any means, but I know he's fought better guys than Augusto Sakai. I know he's faced really bad adversity, especially as of late, against guys better than Augusto Sakai. And it's weird how, okay, so you win two main events, you do really well in another main event, and then you beat your last guy who was ranked number nine. And again, it's kind of you're regressing with who you're fighting. You would think you beat Walt Harris. Okay, maybe he goes up, maybe he fights... Yarzinho again, like there's a few fights that you can make there for uh, over him. Instead, you're making a fight at Gusto Sakai, a guy who's coming off a pretty controversial decision in the first place, a guy who was getting tired in a three-round fight, who committed a bunch of violations to get that win anyways, and they're rewarding him with a main event slot against Alistair over him. So I don't know what the UFC is trying to do, but I think they're trying to make Gusto Sakai lose. I don't know. It's weird. I mean, if you're somebody that's going to look like really hard into the numbers and you're just going to look at the numbers. So you look at the fight that Sky had against Ivanov, and this is the most telling because, and it could be just recency bias, but that was his last fight. So the score is 28, 29, 28, 29, 30, 27. Um, you look at the striking numbers. So in the first round you had Blagoy Ivanov 19 to 16 total over Sakai second round 31 for Ivanov 39 for Sakai the third round 21 for Ivanov 34 for Sakai and Ivanov went all of one of takedowns well that was the one where he grabbed the fence like it was just one where it those numbers don't mean a whole lot and even if I, I have to say this even if you watch the UFC broadcast and they'll throw numbers at you it's ridiculous it's just yeah. trying to they're, they're trying to really appeal to the lowest common denominator to get you excited for a fight. They'll show you advancing stats and numbers. That's the last thing that anybody should look at when they're trying to judge a fight. The, you'll hear it from some of the top commentators. Oh, geez, he worked a takedown. It either wasn't scored a takedown or the guy did nothing with it and it was totally ineffective. So for scoring purposes, some of that means nothing. Striking too, total strikes and certain significant strikes that sometimes they just don't mean anything. You really have to analyze and watch those fights. For me, if Sakai struggled, and listen, he's at a full camp for a five-round fight in this one. So hopefully cardio is a thing that he's worked on, but we've seen it be an issue. Maybe not even in that Sakai fight. We talked about a split decision win over Andre Orlovsky at this point. That's not that great. And I mean, yeah, that fight was, you know, a year, almost a year and a half ago. But that fight was almost a year and a half ago. Yeah. And then the Ivanov fight wasn't that long ago. If you look over on Tapology, out of the votes, 747 at this point, 82% going over him, 76% by knockout. I don't know about that. I mean, listen, we, we've never seen Sakai put out before. If you look at the odds, over him open is a minus 270, currently at a minus 150. A lot of money coming in on Sakai. He opened as a plus 230, sitting at a plus 130. We've seen that with a lot of these fights. The odds have just shifted dramatically right off the hop. Some of them have had a, a little bit of a springboard here and there. This is one of those ones where, again, a lot of money coming in off the initial offering price on Sakai. I don't agree with it. And it's weird because I have to say this with all our full disclosure, really high on Augusto Sakai. Like I, I can't say that enough right now. I know I've really put together a case for Alistair Overeem and we'll put together a, a path to victory for him here. But to me, you have a select few guys that really look like eventually at some point they're going to break into the top 15 and they're going to stick in there for a long time. Augusto Sakai is one of them. I don't think it's oddly enough. I mean, if you if if I said this, you know, eight to nine months ago, it'd be an odd thing to say. But Tanner Bowser, and I've been saying that for a really long time, so you can't call me on the hype train. And my guy, Cyril Gone. I mean, Cyril Gone. I think that guy's a future champ. So those three guys right there, I think, have you know a long enough window to Augusto Sakai, twenty nine years old. He's got a lot of fight left, especially with seventeen pro fights at this point. So I think those three guys have a good opportunity to just keep either keep where they're at or continue to move up the ladder and put on fun fights and, and be ranked guys for a long time. 
I just don't see it in this fight against Overeem unless, again, his chin totally fails him. Sakai throws a lot of nice uh, strikes right straight down the pipe, and I see a lot of, of, of paths. But, again, you're fighting Overeem. You have good leg kicks. He checks leg kicks. Overeem has good movement. Overeem has extremely good uh, an extremely good tie clinch. His kickboxing's obviously world class. He's fought for a title in the he's, past. He yeah, it was the eye test, is what you're saying. Yeah, it was it was four years ago when he had that that title fight, and he clearly felt the tap. And you have to say it every time. But this is a guy that's consistently consistent. His chin just kind of evades him sometimes. It's weird because everyone like over him seems like the nicest person in the world, but for some reason in that loss he felt the tap. Like, like you know, it, it just he was there. He'd know better than I do. I agree, though. Like you mentioned, the things that Gustav Sakai really excels at, it just so happens, Overeem also excels at those things, and he's still, he's quite a bit further along in his career. Again, 29 for a heavyweight is like 16 in most other divisions. Like, you can fight for such a long he's, time. He's, he's pretty much like the Jordan Meehan of heavyweight. Yeah, he's the Chase Hooper of heavyweights right now. Like, he might as well be 19, because you're going to be able to progress for a long time, and just naturally you'll be able to age out a lot of these veterans in the division. Unfortunately, though, over him at 40 right now, it's not that he looks as good as ever, but he's still really, really dangerous for anybody because he's got kind of the perfect combo of I'm really dangerous on the ground with my submissions. If I get top control, my ground pounds absurd, and I can keep you down. And if we're just standing striking, unless you catch me, I'm probably just going to beat the brakes off you. So I think overeem has got this one in the bag. It's one of my more confident picks from this card. But I do think it should be an entertaining fight. I think the future is really great for, for Augusto Sky, excuse me, but overeem has got this one. Matt, we had an awesome weekend last week. I waited till the main event to kind of toot our horns, but I've never had a perfect card before. It was a 10 out of 10. You went nine and one. Uh, the only one that you got wrong was Whitmire and Vienna. And hey, that stuff happened. So really good weekend last weekend. Hoping to follow it up here. Really appreciate everybody tuning in the last couple weeks. It's starting to get a little bit crazy. And I have to say two things to end it. And I honestly never do this. So this is the first time. Shameless plug. But make sure you check out at Fight Name Picks uh, over on Instagram. What we do every week is in the story on Sunday, we put every single fight, you vote for the poll, and I talk about it on our show, question mark kicks. So we get all of those votes in. We're getting into the the triple, the triple, high triple digits in terms of like how many people are voting. So there's a lot of people getting involved. Make sure you find us there and make sure you check out question mark kicks. The show that we do every week, an hour before the event starts, the early prelim starts, I do a full card recap. Matt joins if he doesn't work, which isn't, ever on Saturdays, but I get a chance to go over it. We really get to look at the weigh-ins. I don't normally change my picks all that much, but every now and again, I will. Um, last weekend didn't, again, went 10 out of 10 based on uh, on the regular picks, but we have a lot of fun. The chat gets absolutely insane and it gets flooded, so it's a lot of fun. Make sure you check that out. We got a great event this weekend. I mean, a lot of sleeper fights on here. I'm really excited about the Amadia Pahea fight. I'm excited about, geez, uh, Andrea Muniz, Bartosz Fabinski, and even that one. It should be a snoozer, but I think it's going to be a good one. And Cole Smith, Hunter Azure is probably like one of the sleeper picks for fight of the night. I, it, it's a great card. I know Matt's excited about it. I'm excited about it. For this fight in particular, both going with Alistair Overeem. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. Have a great week. Enjoy the fights. And as we always say, Matt, let's get into it.